some of us here in Vancouver have heard uh, John Elmer speak about the uh, the sort of the global picture in the in the Middle East and Central Asia, the huge reserves of oil and gas that are there for the taking, that is driving uh, the big imperialist countries, uh, especially the United States, but followed by Canada, to war in this part of the world. A recent a study that was uh, printed in the monthly publication of the um, Canadian Senator for Policy Alternatives uh, called um, A Pipeline Through a Troubled Land was authored by John Foster, who's um, an energy economist, former uh, oil industry uh, professional. And um, I, I recommend reading that. It was published in June of 2008, and it really explains um, specific to Afghanistan what are the plans for the oil and gas interests in the world, and in particular that in the area of Afghanistan where Canada is waging its war, this is on the planned route of a uh, 8 to $10 billion pipeline to bring, um, to bring gas from Central Asia to, uh, to an export terminal in, in Pakistan. And so uh, uh, reading that report is extremely important. We do have an opportunity to hear from the Afghan people. Uh, an, an Afghan parliamentarian, uh, Malila Joya, was brought here, uh, has been brought to Canada several times to speak. And there, uh, there is a, a book, uh, a biography, autobiography of hers that's, uh, that's in um, preparation and that will be, uh, that will be published uh, next year and will be extremely important to hear the voices of the Afghan people. Of course, some of us have had the opportunity to hear firsthand the accounts of soldiers that have been, um, actually more often in the case of uh, Iraq with the American war resistors that Sarah spoke about. But their stories are extremely compelling because they're there on the ground and they, they can give the firsthand evidence of the violations of rights that are intrinsic to the war that's being waged. Dave mentioned the Senless Council, which even though it supports the foreign military presence in Afghanistan, has been publishing a lot of the facts and information about what's going on in Afghanistan. And they've drawn in particular attention to the fact that uh, there are no aid and development programs to the Afghan people. That's a myth. That's something that's being sold to you and I to justify the war. But there are no improvements to the daily lives of Afghans that are taking place as a result of this war. And even the Globe and Mail newspaper has a, um, a pretty serious journalist, Graham Smith, who's um, reporting the facts as they see him, I'm sure he doesn't, he's not able to say everything he'd like to say, uh, but there's enough of his reports that come through. So all of this information is out there. I wrote, a, myself and a colleague, uh, Ian Beeching, wrote a, a series of articles in Socialist Voice that we uh, summarized in this pamphlet that you can uh, buy at the information table here. And it really all we did to explain what's going on in Afghanistan is just read carefully uh, everything that's out there. As you look at the kind of material that, that Dave puts on the Stop War blog that uh, if, if you take a little bit of time and it doesn't even take a whole lot of time, you can form a pretty accurate picture of what is uh, taking place in Afghanistan and Canada's role. And when you do that, what you conclude, I think, and I think this is you know consistent with what the, the facts and information report, that the war in Afghanistan is a war of imperial conquest uh, for oil and gas. There are very important energy uh, reserves in Central Asia that the, uh, the big wealthy countries want to get their hands on and Afghanistan doesn't have oil and gas but it is a route for gas and oil pipelines and I mentioned the, uh, in particular the, uh, let me see if I can recall the name, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Tajikistan, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, India pipeline, TAPI is the acronym for it. Um, so it's a war for oil and gas. It's a, a war of competing interests. Um, although there's a, a NATO military uh, mission that's waging the war in, in Afghanistan, these are, um, it's composed of countries that compete with each other economically. And so the old phrase, to the victor go the spoils, very much is in play in Afghanistan. Those who bring the most military power to bear are those that will reap the most benefits. And those that don't choose to uh, participate in the war making and in the conquest will will not re reap the benefits and this is what's drawn uh, Canada along with a number of other secondary imperialist uh, countries into the war in Afghanistan because they they know that they won't uh, they won't benefit from the uh, uh, from the war if they um, if they don't play uh, play a military <coughs> role 
So that's the second thing. It's a, it's, it's a war of competing uh, interests, despite the surface appearance. Um, I think a third thing about the war is that, uh, as I said earlier, the, the notion that there is some kind of aid and development for the Afghan people taking place is a fraud. Uh, we hear this constantly repeated by our political leaders in this country that as a result of the foreign presence in Afghanistan, there's more children going to school in Afghanistan, there's more uh, uh, hospitals providing health care, there's, there's more improvements in, in economic life, and it's the opposite that's the case. In every serious study uh, on this, whether it's from supporters of the war like uh, Senless Council to others who are, um, are critical and, and oppose the war, uh, have shown that to be the case. And that's primarily what's driving the Afghan people to oppose the foreign occupation because in the beginning there was um, uh, a willingness to, uh, to let the foreigners prove their case that they were there to help the Afghan people. And the reason why the Afghan people are turning against the foreign presence is because there isn't any meaningful uh, assistance uh, being given. If there, if there was, it would be quite a different, quite a different story. And then uh, the fourth thing I could say is that, you know, this is a war that targets anyone who gets in the way of its objectives, and that includes the working people of the home countries uh, that are waging the war. Um, and I think uh, Mariana has given a pretty good description of what this war has meant in Canada for people that don't enjoy full citizenship rights. And we all know of what's, uh, uh, what's been taking place uh, since 2001 in that regard. This, together with the war, comes a diminution a reduction of basic democratic rights, um, and whether it's uh, whether it's incarcerations of uh, people who are not citizens, the growing use of guns and tasers by police against anyone who gets in their way, and on and on. And now, of course, the uh, uh, the crowning piece of this uh, war at home is that it will be the consequences of the financial collapse. We see that this whole machinery of war and of Waging war and so-called terrorism is a economically it's a host of cards and it's collapsed in the recent weeks with and this will have terrible consequences for ordinary working people in this country and around the world unemployment uh, cuts to social programs uh, further attacks in democratic rights Canada participates in the in the torture and abuse of, of prisoners in Canada uh, sorry of prisoners in Afghanistan just as it does in Canada. Uh, think of Mayor Arar. But it, they do it in a, uh, in a way in which um, it's not so easily perceived. And so when Canadian soldiers uh, capture an Afghan citizen illegally, as Dave's description of the legality of the war, they uh, turn them over to the Afghan police or army um, to do with as they will. And of course, the Globe and Mail in particular was quite instrumental in finally bringing to the attention of the Canadian public that once those prisoners are turned over, they go into uh, torture centers or even into the common prisons, which by virtue of the conditions of daily life in there uh, amount to torture centers. When I was in Haiti last summer, we visited the prisons of Haiti and it was truly shocking what we saw. But my reading of the descriptions in the Globe and Mail of the Afghanistan prisons is that they're even worse than what I saw in Haiti. And in Haiti, we saw prison cells where there was not enough room for everyone to lie down and sleep at the same time. So, um, so it's a policy of, 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 of torture and abuse of prisoners, but done in an in a arm's length way where the dirty work gets turned over to the Afghan authorities, just as the, uh, the torture of Mayor Arar was turned over to another government to do the dirty work, in this case, Syria. And we have, this is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, how many prisons is, um, you know, the U.S. running around the, around the world, w either directly by themselves or together with other uh, governments that we, don't, uh, that we don't even know about? So formally, Canada does not, um, does not take and hold prisoners in Afghanistan. Um, and so they absolve themselves of the responsibility of what happens to those that they capture by virtue of that. I think um, it's very important that a movement against wars, whether it's in Afghanistan or Iraq or in the case of the occupation of Haiti, really have to be based on the uh, support for the right to sovereignty and self-determination of the peoples in question. Um, and that's, you know, th that's the argument that we have to make against the idea that 
the end that Jack Layton proposes that there should be an end to the combat mission and a continuation of the occupation under a different form. Really what he's talking about is a, is a Haiti type occupation where you have a foreign occupation force there that's suppressing the uh, popular mobilization, be it for political rights or for economic and social development, because that's what's been going on in Haiti for the past four and a half years. And not coincidentally, the Jack Layton and the NDP have had nothing to say about the overthrow of Haiti's elected government, because what is there today in Haiti is more or less their idea of what should happen in countries that, for whatever reason, are deemed to be a threat to capitalist interests. And uh, so that has, you know, that discussion debate on that has to go deeper uh, uh, in the NDP and throughout the labor movement in, in Canada. There was a very interesting uh, tele uh, radio debate, CBC Radio, two days ago, uh, a panel of uh, candidates in the election that brought together, um, among others, uh, Michael Byers from the New, Dem New Democratic Party. He's a very important uh, foreign policy advisor to Jack Layton and the New Democratic Party. And I think that his participation in the radio debate, um, and it's not the only one, but it was the clearest one that I've heard to date, uh, points to uh, the limitations of the position that the NDP is taking in the election that we must be aware of and we must, um, we must li limitations that we have to, uh, uh, to combat and, and fight against. Um, Byers was asked point blank at one point following several callers that called in and said, how come no one in your panel is talking about oil and gas interests in the Middle East and Central Asia as a major factor in the war? And so the, uh, the host of the program, uh, um, uh, Mark Forsyth, the noon program, turned to Michael Byers and said, okay, what is your answer to this caller? Is this a war for oil and gas? And he, he would not answer the question. He said, um, he didn't address the question. He said, uh, the reason why Canada is in Afghanistan is because it wants to do a favor for George Bush and help out uh, the United States in Afghanistan. And so I, I think that's a misrepresentation of what the war is about. And we, uh, any of us who are members of the, the NDP or who are members of affiliated trade unions or who have the occasion to engage uh, representatives of the NDP in, in discussion on the war have to... Um, have to point to the fact that you know part of campaigning against the war is explaining the reality of what it's about. This is a war of, of uh, imperial war and conquest, and we should not uh, avoid uh, saying that. Similarly, we should refute the claims that Canada's participation in this war is bringing uh, progress to the Afghan people, because this was another big feature of the radio debate. And time and again, Ujjal Dosanjh from the Liberal Party and John Cummins from the Conservative Party would talk about how Despite all the difficulties, things are getting better for the Afghan people. More kids are going to school. More people have access to health care and so on. And this is, this is factually wrong. And again, you know, Michael Byers did not respond to this. He was silent uh, in the face of these, uh, these claims. I think the other um, really important um, demand we must make of, of, of the NDP in order to be serious about its, its call for an end to the war in Afghanistan is to insist that they participate in building an effective movement because we're not going to end this war by relying on the good graces of whoever gets elected to, uh, uh, to office in Parliament. It's going to take a, a broad-based movement in the streets, in the, in the workplaces, in the, uh, the educational institutions of the country, and everywhere we can do so to bring the kind of pressure to bear that will put an end to the war and also begin to unravel all of the attacks on social and democratic rights that are a part and parcel uh, of, the, of the war. And so you know, we should expect and in, insist and even demand that the NDP join us in, um, in, in building uh, such a movement. Many members of the party do so, and even uh, constituency associations of the party. Sometimes you'll see their banners at the, uh, the big uh, protest actions that take place, uh, but more is needed. Uh, I could use the example of my own uh, union. I was a delegate at the Canadian Labour Congress Convention in May of this year in Toronto. This is the, the national organization of trade unions. It has more than two million affiliated members. The convention adopted a very positive resolution on Afghanistan, calling for an end to the war, an end to Canada's participation in the war making, and a reorientation of the money that's being wasted on war towards necessary social um, issues in Canada. 
And so this, the, the, the Labour Congress put out um, an election statement at the beginning of this campaign, which uh, many of us got in our, uh, our workplaces, and it makes no reference whatsoever to, to the war in Afghanistan and to the position that we adopted at the convention as, as delegates. And so that's a disservice to, um, to, what, needs to be, uh, what needs to be done. Trade unions should uh, continue to do what many are already doing, which is play a leading role in helping us to build an effective and active anti-war movement. Um, and I think it's very problematic that the CLC would choose to be silent on the issue during the election, because this is precisely when the whole issue of the war should be front and center. And I think, you know, one can observe similar uh, problems in a lot of the, uh, the unions across Canada and also in, in Quebec. I took a look at the uh, website of Quebec Solidaire, which is the new left progressive party that uh, was formed in Quebec a couple of years ago. And uh, there isn't any material on, on the war in Afghanistan and its relation to the uh, present, present uh, federal election. So um, we need to, as an anti-war um, movement as an, and a, as anti-war activists, we need to be campaigning in the, in the mass organizations of, of workers, of students, of, of communities, uh, that they take a stand and become active in uh, opposition to, uh, to the war. I think we also have to, have to look elsewhere in the world where Canada is active in foreign policy. And there are many, many very important parallels to what has taken place with Canada's role in Haiti as to what it's doing in Afghanistan. Canada was part and parcel of the overthrow of an elected and progressive government in Haiti in the year 2004 for many of the same reasons that have taken them into Afghanistan, although not so much the oil and gas issue. I mean, I think probably the biggest failing of all of NDP foreign policy is its uh, support to the State of Israel, which I think is a scandal. And there are many people in the NDP, and, and there are, I think, no doubt, some members of parliament of the NDP that, that do not support um, uh, the NDP support to the State of Israel and, and want to see a democratic and non-religious country state, call it what you will, of, of Palestine. And that's, you know, given the, uh, the treatment that's being perpetrated against the Palestinian people today, I mean, that's a scandalous position that the party has. And it just shows the dimension of the challenge that we have, um, not just with the NDP, but with the affiliated unions. It's, uh, there's been some progress and some inroads made in the unions and championing the rights of the Palestinian people, but we're still really only at the beginning of that process in Canada. Um, so all of us, I think, in this room, you know, have a challenge out there to, uh, to take up as we come out of this election campaign. Awareness of the war has been uh, raised as a result of what's taking place. The conditions are better than ever to build a more active, a stronger and broadly based um, uh, movement against uh, the war in Afghanistan. Our next opportunity to do so here in uh, Canada and in Vancouver is on Sunday, October 19th. Make sure you take some copies of um, this flyer, and there's a large poster out there, too, I believe. Um, it's the next national day of action to protest the war in Afghanistan and call for withdrawal of Canadian troops. It'll take place here in Vancouver at 2 p.m., on Sunday, October 19th at the Vancouver Art Gallery. And there are similar protests to this that are happening across Canada the, the day before, because here in Vancouver the day before on October 18th, there's a very important rally against homelessness and the failure of federal government policy to address the needs of homeless people. Uh, and so the, the, the day of the anti-war action has been bumped full, uh, back by one day. So there's an opportunity for us to, um, to uh, <coughs> to take uh, you know, a, a very specific and concrete uh, measure to uh, help in what is so important uh, today, which is building a, a broader, more active, more effective anti-war movement so we can put an end to the carnage and destruction in Afghanistan and bring about a fundamental change in the course of Canadian foreign policy over the longer term. Thanks.